haunted by a wild stallion. Towards the last of August, my cousin and myself, both of us lads of sixteen, had been plover shooting on the airy plains near Island Head on the Newfoundland coast. Having occasion to go from the Cape to a miner's camp near the head, we decided to proceed around the cliffs where the air was fresh and bracing in preference to the sod and tiresome marshes further inland. About three o'clock we set out, having a tramp of eight miles before us. Our course lay close to the edge of those sheer iron-bound cliffs that rise haughtily out of the sea to a height of from two hundred to five hundred feet. Not a bush was in sight, upland and hollow being covered with a short, thick growth of grass and succulent weeds. It was tiresome and sometimes perilous work to descend a couple of hundred feet into one of these gorges and scale the other side again. I have often, when a lad, inquired whence came the succession of these mighty hollows along this and other parts of my native coast. At first sight, you would not attribute the tremendous gouging out to the action of flood, for only a tiny brook a couple of feet wide and incapable of rounding its pebbles hurries along to fling its little thin silvery body over the precipice into the sea. But reflection has since taught me that they must be due to mighty torrents caused by the melting glacier that spared Newfoundland, then a part of the mainland, no more than any other portion of the continent. On the mountain tops we shot plover and curlew till our ammunition was exhausted, and the sun was only half an hour high. Then we quickened our pace, for the camp of the miners was still six miles distant. As we reached the top of the highest plateau, jaded from the exhausting climb, we heard the far-off but keen, vicious whinny of a horse. We spoke not, but looked at each other, for we were now aware of what we had forgotten before, that the wild stallion Black Glossy was grazing about those airy meadows. Further down the coast were other stallions let loose during the summer while the fishermen were away in their boats, but none was so much to be dreaded as this fierce brute, whose name sent terror into the heart of every timid traveler. We had no means of defense, having fired away our ammunition, but we were cool and promptly decided to get off level ground and trust to escape in some cliffside or slope where the beast could not get a footing. So we were off with the speed of the wind. About a third of a mile beyond us lay the edge of a slope that ran down to a small cave, and from a dim recollection which I had retained of the spot, I was in hopes if we could reach there before the stallion to make our escape. Again came the same wild neigh, and in the distance we could hear the dull thud of hoofs upon the hard, dry top of the upland. I glanced hastily around and at a distance of about a third of a mile, saw our pursuer. He was as black as a raven, and the shining of his coat I could see even at that distance. His head curved downward, his body seemed to be gathered up and shortened, and his tail stringed out behind him. Our terror almost lent wings to our feet. Nearer and wilder grew the whinny, but we scarce trusted ourselves to look back. We were nearing the slope, but I was not certain that the portion we were approaching was gradual enough to afford a foothold. I had breath enough to say to my cousin Ned, If he overtakes us, our only chance is to stop short, swerve aside, and then dart straight ahead again, which will cause him to curve round and lose time. It is his heels that we have most to guard against." We were at the slope and found that it was not so steep as we could have desired it. Below a small brook brawled over the stones down the incline to be lulled and lost in the sand between high tide mark and the stretch of wild meadows at the foot of the hill. Nimbly we ran down, but fifteen paces above us, at the spot where we had begun the descent, was the stallion. He did not, as I supposed he would, rush headlong down, but snorted and pawed the sand with his forehoofs. Then, wheeling, he galloped in the direction of a faint path that led through a more level passage. We knew that he must reach the bottom of the valley almost as soon as we could, so we sprang, ran, and sometimes found ourselves rolling 
down the steep, grassy slope. The neighing of the infuriated brute was now more constant and more appallingly shrill, and the three walls of the hollow gave echoes of the vicious cry till it seemed to our terrified imagination as if we were being pursued by twenty demon horses. The sun, too, had just gone down, and in this lonely place, walled by great mountains, with a weird marsh and a complaining surf before us, superstitious fear was added to the terror of pursuit. We reached the bottom safely, and observed running out into the cave a narrow ledge of rock. Upon that was all I had breath to say, hastily indicating the rock with my hand. Then we struck out across the marsh, and the terrible brute was close by us, his tail in the air, nostrils distended, his eyes bloodshot. We stopped short and swerved to the left when he was so close that we might have felt his hot breath upon us, and as he curved round, almost losing his legs, we darted on. I shall never forget the thrill of that moment in watching the result of our maneuver. As he swept round, his tongue was out and he flung foam from his open jaws. His thin slippers, bright from running over the grass, gleamed almost in our faces as he wheeled round. Our ruse had saved us. Ere it was necessary to repeat the trick, we had both mounted the rock and were nimbly running out to its furthest point with a spray broke slightly over us. From this point we could leap upon a larger rock whence we might take a long range of strand to our right after the tide had ebbed another half hour. Now the danger and the terror over, we could not but enjoy the discomfiture of our baffled pursuer. A dozen times did he rush out to the surf, plash the water with his hoofs, and plow up the sand. Then he would go careering along the marshes marge, with mane erect, uttering his shrill, fierce, winning, and filling every nook about the cliffs with terrifying echoes. We jumped upon the larger rock and stood there, awaiting the fall of the tide. The gloaming deepened, and still the maddened brute raved up and down the strand, plashed into the marsh, tearing up the lilies and the violet flag blooms with his infuriate feet, crying all the while like a balked fiend. And when it became totally dark, before the rising of the moon, we could see gleaming out of the deep dusk by the verge of the marsh two eyes that resembled kindled emeralds. Beyond the rock on which we stood, every now and again a fin or a tail would break the surface of the water and scatter myriad little phosphorescent beads about like showers of silver spray. The splashing was probably made by sharks, for before the darkness came, we could see them lurking around the rocks in the clear green waters and at intervals pushing a black fin above the surface. We had at the first thought of leaving our guns behind us on the rock and wading and swimming around the point to the strand, but the terror of a shark's crunching jaws was not more welcome than the shining heels or the vicious teeth of the stallion. When the moon rose above the sea, the tide was out and left a dark belt around the base of the rock. Once more our eyes searched for the foiled horse. He was beyond the marsh, standing in deep gloom under the shoulder of the precipice. The last thing I remembered noting as I slid from the rock upon the clammy shingle were two globes of smoldering fire looking toward our point of departure. And as we passed around the point, that terrible neigh, it was the last time we heard it, again started a hundred echoes. About nine o'clock we reached the miners' camp, eating the more heartily and sleeping the more soundly for our afternoon of strain and terror. End of Hunted by a Wild Stallion <laughs>